Praise the Lord, church. I'm trying to tell you, sometimes I wish he would just do announcements all night long. Hallelujah. Tonight I don't plan to be too long, but from our bishop's announcement, I do feel like I'm on the right track here. I believe like it must be something that the Lord is trying to tell us today. So if you will, please open up your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, and one verse of Scripture, verse 9. Very familiar passage. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, and then verse 9. And it simply reads, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And for our subject today, I want to speak to you for just a few minutes from this title. Don't give up your difference. Don't give up your difference. There's many in the world today who would like for you to just coexist and just be a part of what they're doing. But please, don't give up your difference. If our pastor would pray for us. Let's bow our head, dear Lord Jesus. Lord, we lift you up on high. We honor you. We magnify your name. And your name, Lord, is known in all her palaces as a refuge. We thank you that we have found in you a hiding place. And we have found refuge in you, Lord. And we have fled to thee. We thank you, Lord God, because you're God by yourself. You told Isaiah that you know no other God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. Thank you for water baptism in your name and being filled with your spirit. Thank you that you took us out of sin and you took us, Lord, into the place where we are safe. You brought us into your banquet and house and your banner over us is love. We thank you for the revelation of truth, Lord, and we thank you that we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. What a privilege it is, Lord, to be called by your name. And to, Lord, to dwell in your presence. The apostle said that we are made to sit together in heavenly places. Lord, how wonderful it is. How blessed we are. How thankful we are for all that you have done for us. You, Lord God, kept us safe. And you have charted a course for our lives. Many you have brought from the ruined field of sin. And you have brought them to a place of safety. We thank you for your eternal word. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We thank you for the church of the living God that you have established. Lord, as a beacon, oh, God, as an ark of safety. We thank you that we're in it tonight. Thank you for your word. Lord, as Brother Scott stands to minister as an oracle of thine, I pray you'd lay your nail scar head upon him. Touch him in a very powerful way. Touch his mind. Give him the word. Let him minister, oh God. Amen. That you get the glory and you get the honor and the praise. And we will be enlightened and we will be strengthened with might to go another mile. We thank you that you have kept us. We thank you have made provision for us. We thank you that you watched over us. Moreover, angels watch over us and you've built a hedge around us. And Lord God, we are the apple of your eye. You said that we're graven in the palm of your hand. We're so thankful. We're so privileged. Privilege. We're so good. Lord God, grateful for all you have done for us. Lord, let your word come. Let it challenge us. Let it shape us. Let it change us. Let it mold us, God, to be more like you. We want to dwell in your presence. We want to enjoy the smile of your face. And we need the sunshine of your face, Lord, to shine upon us tonight. Lord, we're privileged people, and we're very thankful for it. 
take right now every authority and power over everything that is unlike you. We bind it. We cast it down. Lord, with violence and God, we say it shall not operate. And then we release the spirit of truth and revelation and faith and power and conviction, Lord, that you get the glory. You get the honor. Every devil will be horrified. Everything will be brought down and your name will be exalted, exalted on high to reign, to rule, to use authority and power, that your name will be strong and be highly set by and people will come to dwell on the banner and under the umbrella of your name. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. We lift you up. We exalt your name. Thou, O oh God, art great and greatly to be praised. David said, from the rising of the sun to the going down of, your name is to be praised. So we praise your name. We honor your name. We thank you for our heart to praise you. We thank you for our mind to worship you. We thank you for our spirit that we can lift you up, Lord. Hear from heaven. Perform. Let your eyes be over this place. Let your ears be attentive to the prayer that is made from this place. Let the people know that you're God by yourself. There is not a God beside you. You say you know no other. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that we are a blessed and privileged people. Lay your hand upon us. Strengthen us. Make paths for us. Make ways for us. Open doors that men would close to us. Because you, Lord, give power. You have dominion. Your kingdom shall cover the earth. And you shall reign as king of kings and lord of lords. We thank you because you're God by yourself. Every mouth shall be stopped in your presence. And you'll be glorified. And we will be still be praising you when heaven and earth pass away, when the clouds roll back as a scroll, when the sky give way, you will still be Lord of all. We thank you. We praise you. We bless you. We honor you. We glorify you. We magnify you. Oh, God, for thou art great and greatly to be praised. Lord God, have your own way. Be thou God in this earth. Be thou God in new life. Be thou God in temper. Let the earth know that you're God. Let the world know. We will publish it. We will talk about it. We will teach it that you are God by yourself. Hear from heaven. Perform and do as we ask this mercy in the wonderful, all saving, powerful, all enduring, all encompassing name of Jesus. And all the people said amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's lift up the name In of the Jesus Lord one more name. time before you're seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. About a week or so ago, I was driving in my car, and I was probably on my way here. And there was a car in front of me, and um, there was a bumper sticker that I had seen many times before. But this day, I really began to look at the bumper sticker, if you will. And the bumper sticker simply said, coexist, if we can put that up on the screen said coexist through a series of symbols it was making a statement in this day when i looked at it i became curious about it though i've seen it before i wanted to know more about its origin and why are people actually putting this sticker on their car and so i began to do a little research and i realized that it's very interesting, the movement, if you will, that is taking place in our country. It's not a new movement. It's a very, very, very old movement. But it's gaining ground in recent years. In this bumper sticker, there is a crescent moon for the letter C. If you'll go to the next slide. 
And this crescent moon is representing the religion Islam. The letter O, sometimes it's a peace symbol. Other times on different bumper stickers, it may be the Wiccan pinnacle, witchcraft. The letter E, it's the male, female symbol. There's so many different ideas of what it could mean. Some people are saying that it has its origin in people who are trying to promote the LGBT community. And then there's the scientific equation E equals MC squared, which is an obvious reference to Scientology. There is the letter X, which is the star of David, representing Judaism. The letter I, if you don't look at it really well, you probably won't notice it, but the, the, the actual line in the eye means nothing. It's the circles on the top of the eye. One of them is the pagan pinnacle, and the other, again, is the Wiccan pinnacle. The letter S is for the Chinese yin-yang symbol, or Taoism. And then the last letter is T, an obvious r reference to, quote unquote, Christianity. I read a lot about it and I realized that really the E, the O, the I and the S, this was just something that they put into this bumper sticker to make it make sense. But the three organizations that they are trying to talk to through this bumper sticker is Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, and mainly Christianity. Those symbols are represented because they're wanting us to let down our guard and say, you know what? We won't stand for the things that we stood for in the past, but we are just going to let down our guard and get along with everyone else. I found that Bono, the lead singer of a singing group called U2, a lot of you may know of him, he is one of the leaders of the Coexist movement. Bono is the same Bono that joined with Kirk Franklin and Crystal Lewis and Mary J. Blige and R. Kelly to create a gospel song called Lean On Me, Go Figure, that group creating a gospel song. Bono was named Time Magazine Man of the Year in 2009. So that means he has a certain amount of influence. Bono was the keynote speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast in 2006. Go figure, a rock star is the keynote speaker. article I read said Bono stopped five songs into one of his sets at a concert. He tied a headband on his head, which simply had a handwritten statement, coexists. He then pointed to the three symbols, the cross, the star of David, and the crescent moon, and began to chant, Jesus, Jew, Muhammad, all true. Jesus, Jew, Muhammad, all true. Exactly, he's a liar. But he's chanting, and you know what happened? There was people in the audience who began to join in with him. And there's a movement underway. And what it wants us to do as a religious group is to just let down what we've said in the past and not be so dogmatic about what we believe in. Come on, we need to be more tolerant of other religions. He's saying to us that every religion has some validity. And we're saying, but there's only one religion that God accepts. This coexist movement is asking us to let down our guard is asking us to move away from our standards. It's asking us to shut our mouths so that we can allow 
quote unquote, peace to reign in. The writer quotes parts of his speech at the National Prayer Breakfast and it says, says I have avoided religious people for most of my life. This is Bono, the keynote speaker who says, I have avoided religious people most of my life. And then he goes on to say that he could appreciate the absurdity of being a rock star quoting scripture. Even he knew it didn't make sense. The writer goes on to say in recent years, much of the skepticism concerning him has fallen away. He is a doer, President, President Bush said of Bono at the prayer breakfast. The thing about this good citizen of the world is he has used his position to get things done. He's using his position to change the minds of people. People who once stood for something, he's using his position to cause them to back off from saying the things that they used to say, for living the way that they used to live. He's using his position to get into the minds of everyone. And I'm telling you, there's a movement underway that is trying to get into your mind and get into your heart and to stop you from being apostolic. It wants you to give up the difference that God gave you. God was the one who put a difference in us. God was the one who saved us from our sins. God was the one who took us out of the club. God was the one who took us off of drugs. And he's telling us, give it all up and say it's all the same. It's not the same. I know a lot of people who've been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And they've tried to live righteous all their lives, and they couldn't do it. And they came into an apostolic church. They went down in water in Jesus' name, and they said, it's a difference. It's a difference. I'm able to live righteous. I'm able to live holy. God filled me with the Holy Ghost, and I'm able to live like I want to live for him. But they're asking you to give up your difference. Give it up. Well, I'm sorry, I can't give up my difference. I can't give up what God has done for me. See, I know where I was. I know how far down I was. You may look at me now and you might not know where I was, but I know what it was like being around a toilet stool, throwing up, praying to God and asking him, Lord, if you just help me out of this situation, I promise I'll never do it again. I want, I mean, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking to God with fever. And then all of a sudden he helps me out of that situation and I'm back at it again. I know what it's like to be in a neighborhood and be afraid, always looking around because so many people have sent messages to me telling me they were gonna kill me. And God saved my soul. God put me on a rock. God have me now where I can go anywhere. I can go walk up and down 15th Street and those devils are scared of me. And you want me to give up my difference? You want me to say that it's the same thing that you have? You don't have what I have. You don't have what I have, Bono. You don't have what I have. That's why you still long for something even though you have all the money. You still long for something in your life because you don't have what I have. I have a difference and it's not for sale. <laughs> to coexist means that we would have to give up some things. It means it would be no longer acceptable to state your beliefs if it's going to make somebody else feel uncomfortable. How many times have you gone into your job and heard somebody talking about the Lord or what happened at their church and you're hearing the things that they're talking about? Oh, 25 people got saved and you know they didn't get saved. But you're going to shut your mouth because they want you to back off and not get involved in the conversation. They don't want you to stand up and say, you know what? I hear what you're saying, but how did they get saved? Well, you know, they confess God in their heart. Well, I'm sorry, baby. That's not the way it works. You need to repent. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They don't want you to say that. You're going to have to give that up to coexist. You're no longer going to be acceptable to say that there's only one God. You're going to have to include Allah. 
You're not going to be able to say that there's only one correct faith. You're going to have to say that there's many roads that lead to heaven. You're not going to be able to say that there's only one baptism. So anybody who's been baptized any other way than in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to have to accept that if you're going to coexist. Are you going to give up your difference? Are you going to give up your difference? Well, I'm not going to give up mine. We are considered dogmatic, ultra-religious, intolerant radicals who spread hate. That's what they say of us. The bishops say that's okay. That's okay. That's what they say about us. Simply because we say that there's only one God and his name is Jesus. Simply because we tell them about the power of the Holy Ghost. They tell us we're spreading hate when we're telling them Jesus can take you out of your mess. That's what we're telling them. Jesus can save your soul, but this is the way that you have to go to him. And then they say we're spreading hate. Well, if they're spreading hate, I'm a hate spread. Just call me a hater. Just call me a hater. If they're spreading hate, then I'll be the number one hater. Because I'm going to tell it everywhere I go. You've got to repent. You've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you do that, all your sins will be washed away. You'll never, ever, ever have to worry about walking and living in a life of sin again when he fills you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because he's going to give you the power to live righteous and holy. I'm not going to give that up. Don't give up your difference. It's a difference that we have. The mainstream world has caught on to this ideology hook, line, and sinker. And so now things that people in America used to once stand up against, they have now embraced. This is why they have two TV shows like The Modern Family and The New Normal. Because they have embraced this coexist movement. Mark Twain said this once. He said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Whenever you find yourself going with what this world is doing, you need to take a, a breather and stop and look around and say, where am I? Why am I thinking this way? What has gotten into my heart? Because this is not the word of God. You've got to realize that there is a movement in the world that wants to change you, that wants to take away what makes you different, that wants to take away what is beautiful in God's eyes. So I'm declaring today that there is a difference that we must possess and that we must maintain. The apostolic church can't just coexist. We can't do it because in order to do it, we would have to give up our difference. We would have to bow down to their gods. And so tonight I want us to look at three things quickly concerning our difference. See, God's people throughout the scriptures have been commanded to maintain a difference from everyone else in the world. And from the very beginning, there has been a movement to take away that difference. The devil has always wanted our difference. But we can't simply give up because the difference that we have is what connects us to our God. And so firstly... Let us look at two areas that God commanded his people to maintain a difference in. Firstly, Genesis, Genesis 19, uh, 17 and 9, we're talking about circumcision. It says, this is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. God is talking to Abraham, and he's saying, look, since I've made an agreement with you, I'm going to be a, your God, and you're going to be my people. He says, and there's going to be a token of this agreement that you're going to bear with you all the days of your life. He said that you're going to have to cut the foreskin off. Most of us know what that means. And so there's a physical difference that his people had to bear. Now, 
this physical difference wasn't something that was casual. It wasn't something that you could do if you thought it was a good idea, but if you didn't real life, really feel like doing it one day, you didn't do it. This was something that you had to do because if you did not, exactly, oh gosh. Exodus 4.18, speaking of M Moses, it says, and it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him, speaking of Moses, and sought to kill him because he did not circumcise his son, because his wife was against it. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. God was going to kill him because of the difference. See, you can't allow peer pressure to take away your difference. Just because you are in a seemingly hostile environment and everybody on your job seems to believe something else, don't mean you can sit there and be quiet. There's a difference. God has commanded you to tell the people. And if you're going to sit there and hide, if you're going to sit there and deny that there's something different about you, you're going to find yourself in trouble with God. You need to stand up and in the midst of any situation, it don't matter what it is. I don't care what they're saying. I don't care what they believe. You need to be able to say that there's only one God. You got to understand, he's their only hope. He is their only hope. Without Jesus Christ, they're not going to make it to heaven. And you hiding the fact that you believe in one God and you know that that one God can save them is not helping their situation at all. Don't give up your difference because they depend on it. Well, I know that when you're in those situations, you feel uncomfortable. I know that sometimes your boss may say, you know what I'm saying, we're not supposed to talk about spiritual stuff when you say stuff, but when they're talking about spiritual stuff, everything's just fine. Yeah, I've been in that situation too. I know. But guess what? You still can't give up your difference because they're threatening you. You still can't give up your difference because they're going to persecute you. They persecuted the Lord, but yet everywhere he went, he proclaimed that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Even when people couldn't stand to hear it, even when people said that they were going to stone him, he still would say, it's me. I'm the only way. And so we need to be able to declare it. The difference has to be maintained. Paul said to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 7:19. He said, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. We are in the New Testament church, and I know I've had my sons circumcised, but guess what? That didn't make them a Jew. That didn't put them in a relationship with God. As they come of age, they have to have a relationship with God. Paul is telling the church that, look, that there was a time when you had to cut the foreskin, but he's saying now it's something in your heart that has to change. You see, you can't be the same way that you always was and then just think you're going to go to heaven. Now, I know that there's people in the world that you work with that live in your neighborhood that would like to believe that and they don't want to hear you say nothing else. But you've got to tell them that, look, you can't keep doing the mess that you're doing and thinking you're going to make it to heaven. How are you going to keep lying, stealing, and cheating, fighting, beating people, cheating people, and think you're going to make it to heaven? How do you think you're going to keep getting drunk, fornicating, and doing all of these things and still make it to heaven? No, they don't want to hear it, but it's the truth. No, they don't like it when you say it, but it's the truth. And it's the difference between God's people and the world. And it's the difference that we can't give up. He says that it's a keeping of the commandments. Paul said to the Romans in Romans 2, 28 through 29, he said, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, 
which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So what he said is this. He said a Jew is not a Jew because he put on a tallit and a yarmulke and go stand at the wailing wall. Our president went to the wailing wall and he had a yarmulke on his head. That does not make him a Jew. He said a Jew is a Jew if he's a Jew inwardly. So just because you put on the paraphernalia doesn't make you a Jew. What's in your heart makes you a Jew? He said, by the same token, circumcision is not that circumcision when you snip the foreskin. No, that's just the outward appearance. He said, but the circumcision that you need to have is when some things get cut away in your heart. When you stop loving some things in this world. When all of a sudden your heart begins to change and you begin to love the things of God more than you love those things in the world. He says, that's the difference that I'm looking for. I'm not no longer looking for the cutting off of a foreskin. I want to see what's in your heart. How different are you from the rest of the world? Is there a difference? God is looking for it. If there's not a difference in your life, you better find a difference. You better figure out how to get a difference because he's looking for it. Being apostolic happens in your heart. Not everybody that walks through these doors, unfortunately, is apostolic. Not everybody that pays their tithes to this church is apostolic. Not everybody in ministry with you is apostolic. Outwardly, they may be. But that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a difference in your heart. Do you really believe this message? Or are you willing to give it up for something else? If something else comes along and looks a little better, it's going to give you a lot less stress. Going to make you do a f you know, f few more things, uh, a few less things. I'm telling you, some people, I'm telling you, if they can find a preacher who's going to tell them they can go to the club, they're going to leave. If they find a preacher who's going to tell them that, look, marijuana is a herb from the earth. I'm trying to tell you. And God said that it was good. And I agree. They're going to leave. Promise you that. But then there's going to be some people who may in their flesh say, man, you know what? I kind of wished it was that way. But I can't give up the difference because I know what it means for me. <laughs> Though in my flesh I might want to do those things, I'm not going to do them anymore because it's going to displease my God. And that's the difference I have from the world. See, the world will do whatever makes them feel good. The world is going to do whatever floats their boat. But what you got to do is what the word of the Lord says. What you need to do is what God says. What I've got to do is what the word of the Lord says. I can't give up my difference for something else. The difference comes with the inward change that begins with baptism in the New Testament circumcision. Or the New Testament circumcision. Colossians 2, 11 through 12. The word of the Lord reads, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye were risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Circumcision is a surgical procedure. That means that every little baby boy that is going to be circumcised has to go through a surgery of some sort. In the same way, your baptism is your spiritual circumcision. Now, most people who go through a surgery, if you've ever been through one, Somebody has to put you to sleep. That guy is called an anesthesiologist. But the anesthesiologist, nine times out of ten, is not doing your surgery. And if he is, you need to find another hospital because that's not his job. And so when we, you come to this church, yes, I can take you up there. Quran, he got baptized this morning. I took him, and I baptized him in the name of Jesus, right? 
But I didn't perform surgery on them. I was just the one that took them under. I was the anesthesiologist. It was Jesus, when he went under the water, who reached into his little life and took every sin that he ever committed away. It was Jesus who kept him clean and washed him clean. Every person that is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what happens to you. All of your sins are washed away. Now, we all know you can't go to heaven with sins on you. So if we're going to coexist with the Wiccans, we got to say, well, you've never been baptized in Jesus' name. You've been serving false gods and putting eggs in the ground and watching them die and praising all of this crazy foolishness, but some kind of way you're going to make it to heaven. No, 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 no. I got a difference. And I'm not going to give it up just to please somebody else. I'm not going to give it up just to make somebody else feel good. Guess what? I had to come to the same conclusion that everybody else is going to have too, that this is the only way. There was other things I wanted to do with my life. Come on. Not many of us came to God just because we wanted to. God was the one wooing us the whole time. We wasn't wooing him. It wasn't like God was running from us and we was trying to catch him. No, no, no. We were the ones running and God was after us. And then when he called us, he said, now look here, son. This is what you're going to have to do. What you mean I can't hang out with my homies no more? What you mean I got to stop cursing? What you mean I got to stop drinking? What you mean I can't? The club for real? I mean, what about a little bit of marijuana? Not a lot. No blunts, just joints. What? I, I, I got to give her up? I got to give him up? Oh, oh. He says, well. If you want to be with me, you got to let all that go. See, that's the difference. The difference is people who are serious about God are willing to give up some things. People who are really serious about God and say, you know what? I, I, I'll give those, those fellas up. I'll give those girls up. I'll give up my friends. I'll give up my family members. I don't really care. I want you, Jesus. I'll give up whatever I got to give up. Well, maybe some of you are not ready to do that. The next thing is, his people had to sacrifice. Come on. Leviticus 1, beginning in verse 1, reads, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, if any, man, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herb, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herb, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Sacrifice is something that God people has always had to do. From the beginning in the garden, when God sacrificed the first animals to make skins for Adam and Eve, from generation to generation, they begin to hand down this practice of sacrifice. They're sacrificing to their God. Cain didn't get it. He really didn't understand what it was all about. Because sacrificing is never a pretty thing. To take an animal and cut its neck and drain the blood and burn it up, it's just not a very pleasant thing. You could say, well, for them it was probably normal. I would say no. I would say, yeah, probably killing an animal and cooking it is one thing, but to just burn an animal on an altar to God, it's, it's not a very pleasant thing. And if you're doing it multiple times a day, that had to be a very smelly place, very bloody place. Then you have to think about it from an agricultural standpoint. Not everybody had animals. And if I was going to sacrifice, then that means I was going to have to give up something. I was going to have to take my vegetables and barter them for this animal. 
or I was going to have to go and take my vegetables and take them to the temple. I'm losing something in the situation. God has always called for his people to give up some things. That is the difference. Many religions, Joel Osteen, I promise you, he's not trying to get you to give up nothing. Maybe a few dollars. He said that he don't even talk about sin. Say he don't want to do that because he don't want to offend anybody. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend you, but if you are a sinner, you need to get right with Jesus. And the reason why is because if you get right with Jesus, then your life will be so much better. Your life will be so much better the things that you've tried to do. Listen, I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. A day. And I tried to stop smoking. I promise you, I tried everything in the world. I played games to try. I tried to, you know, put money in the pot to try, and I could not. And most smokers are the same way. You very rarely find a smoker who's never tried to stop smoking. But they can't do it. Patches, gum, all of the other stuff don't work. Let me tell you what works. The name of Jesus. <laughs> Submitting to the name of Jesus. Going down in water in the name of Jesus. Being filled with the Holy Ghost. That is what works. That's what taking crackheads off the street and made them productive citizens. That's what's taking prostitutes off the street and made them CEOs. Okay, you, you may not believe it, but I'm telling you, it's the name of Jesus. He's the only one that can do it. So that's why I have to tell you, because in your heart, I know that you're looking for another way. I can't tell you how many times I was in the club with my friends and I'm looking at him and saying, man, we come here every week and do the same thing. Is there something different? I mean, it's the same old clubs, the same old people. You get tired of looking at them. The same old fights. I mean, I mean, you do the same thing over and over and over, and at some point you'll be like, man, God, there's got to be something different. There is. It's called the church. And then he said he'll give you life more abundantly. Sacrifice is something that's just a part of our life. It's the difference that God gave us from the rest of the world. Romans 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, people may not understand why I live the way I live. But I live like this because it's the difference. It's the difference from the rest of the world. People know when you're living right. They know it. You can go into your job, you can get a job and go and just go to your job and not even say much to people. And they'll know that you go to church. They'll know you have a relationship with God. It's the difference because of the way you live. You have presented your body a living sacrifice. And so when they're talking about foolishness, you don't jump into that because you know that your spirit is not going to feel good about that. When they're talking about, hey, let's go after work and go to this bar, you're like, I, I can't do that. I don't do that. Why are you wearing dresses all the time? Why are you doing this? It's the difference. It's the difference. And I can't give it up. Listen, people, don't give up your difference. The devil wants your difference. The world wants your difference. Don't give up your difference. Secondly, there's always been a movement to take away your difference. In the garden, Adam and Eve falls prey to the devices of a serpent who's simply angry because he's been kicked out of heaven he know he's going to hell. And these people are perfect. They're perfect. They have something he don't have. They have a relationship with God. Every morning, God is coming and talking with them, and he's getting madder and madder by the day. And he said, you know what? I got to take it away from them. And so he tempted them, and they fell. And they fell away from God. He wanted their difference. We can look at the story of the th three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezariah in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, he tries to change their name 
because he wants to change their identity. He doesn't want them to know who they are. He doesn't want you to know that you are a royal priesthood. He don't want you to understand what it means to be a peculiar people. He don't want you to know what it means to be holy. So he wants to strip that away from you. And so what he did, he changed the name. But that wasn't enough. So now he creates this God out of materials from the earth. And then he says, now I need you to bow down before it. Don't you realize that every day this world is trying to get us to bow down to something other than God? Wanting us to take away this difference. Don't want you to tell nobody you apostolic. That's the last thing this world wants you to do is to walk up into any place and tell somebody you apostolic. They don't mind you telling them that you are a nurse, that you work at whatever place you work at or what you, whatever you do. Don't care about that. Oh, they don't even care if you tell them, oh, you can sing. They don't, you, whatever you have, whatever talent you have, you can tell them that. But they don't want you to say that you're apostolic. They don't want you to say that you believe in one God. Don't want you to do it. And that's what he was doing to these three Hebrew boys. He wanted it. And this is the problem. He's trying to make them bow down to this image. And these young men were raised hearing from little children. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thine soul, and with all thine might. They had been raised hearing this every day. It's being put in them that there's only one God. You got to love him. And they know that this God is not some God that you can create with your hands. But yet, this Babylonian king is trying to take that difference away from them. He doesn't want them to continue to pray to Jehovah. He doesn't want them to continue to pray to their God. He wants to strip them of that. And this world is trying to get you to back off from the house of God. This world will do whatever it can. It'll show you, it'll make things seem so fun. I mean, goodness, it just makes the world seem so fun. Think about how many people have been attracted by the things of the world and gone just to have fun and lost their life. Because the devil for sure is not going to show you that. There's never going to be a commercial. That's going to be a liquor commercial. That's going to show you having fun in the club, drinking, and then show you over that toilet. That's not going to happen. Because then they're not going to sell much. It's going to show you how much fun you can have in the world. When really it's just a setup to destroy you. Anything that the devil was trying to get you to back off from in this house is so you can come into his territory. Because once you come into his territory, then he know now you belong to me. Once you leave the safety of the kingdom of God, once you keep leave the safety of the word of God, you give up your identity, well, then he can have his way with you. Every day, we are having to maintain the difference. The question is, are we really willing to maintain it? Are we really willing to look weird, to be the weird one at our jobs? The one that everybody else don't really want to talk to because when you open your mouth, you only want to talk about Jesus. Are you really willing to be persecuted? Are you really willing to have somebody misunderstand you? You're trying to witness to them because you want to see them saved, and then they feel like you're just coming against them. You talking about their grandmother wasn't, a, you know, wasn't saved and she ain't in heaven. I mean, how many of you had that happen to you? You're trying to tell them about what the Holy Ghost can do for them, and they want to take it to somebody that's not even here no more. Are you willing to maintain that difference and to keep on saying, you know what, this is the truth. I don't care what the world says. If they tell us, look, speaking against homosexuality is a hate crime, well, I'm sorry. 
I can only tell you what the Word of God says. I can't deny it. If you ask me, I have to tell you. Matter of fact, you don't even have to ask me. I just got to preach it because you need to hear it. Are we willing? See, you need to know that there's a danger in giving up your difference. If we look at the story of Balak and Balaam, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to really shorten this story, but we need to look at the fact that maintaining a difference is important. Balak is a Moabite king who wants to destroy Israel. He wants Balaam to curse God's people. And Balaam is just saying, look, I got to say whatever God say, and I can't curse these people. And every time he goes to do it, he pronouncing blessings over them. And we love that. We love the fact. I mean, Bishop, you was preaching about it this morning, how, you know, we are blessed and our enemies can't do nothing but bless us. Our enemies, they, don't, they can't do nothing to us. If, if, if the devil's been telling you that he can destroy you, he's a liar. Because the Bible says that you have power over all the power of the enemy. So anything he does to you is only going to somehow make you stronger and bless you. You're going to find out that you had some gift that you didn't even know you had. You're going to realize that God is really with you in a way that you've never known before. So anything that the enemy tries to do to you, it's going to bless you. And we love it. And we talk about it. Oh, man, I'm talking about he tried it. How many times? Three times. He just said, oh, yeah, I'm going to try to curse him. Oh, I can't do it. I keep blessing him. And, and Balak is getting mad. But then in Numbers 25, Beginning in verse 1, it says, And Israel abode in Shittim, a large city in Moabite. And, uh, it says, And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto sacrifices of their God. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. As long as there was a difference, man, your enemies... They can try to hurt you, and they just blessing you. But the minute you give up your difference, the minute you decide, well, I know, I know she's not apostolic, but she sure is fine. So, you know, Bishop, I understand what you're saying, but we're going to go to the courthouse. We're going to do this, and we're coming back. The minute you give up your difference, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to call my old homies and we're going to go hang out. Then let's see what happens. It says, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. You can lose your life giving up your difference. Yeah, I know you, that's another thing. It's uncomfortable even here sometimes when you have to hear that, wait a minute, I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I got the Holy Ghost. What you talking about, Brother Dedrick? I'm talking about if you give up your difference, you go and walk away from here and deny this. Tell people, oh, man, that stuff is all fake. There's people who do that. You can lose your life. You may never, ever, ever get another chance to repent. I've known too many people that walked away from the church. They didn't get a second chance. A lot of people would like to believe that if they walk away, God is going to still have mercy upon them. When you have the anger of the Lord kindled against you, it's a very dangerous thing. You don't want to give up your difference. You don't want to give up your difference because there's danger in giving up the difference that you have. This world wants you to give up your difference because you reflect what they should be. John 3.19 says, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The reason why they want your difference is because you make them feel uncomfortable, because they know that they should be doing right. 
See, it's just something in man that knows that they should be worshiping God. But because they love themselves more than they love God and they want to do what they want to do, they don't want you coming around and putting your finger on the stuff in their lives that's wrong. And so because you can live the life, you are light to them. And that's why they don't like you. And that's why they want to take away what you have. They don't want you coming into work and talking about God. So that's why they keep trying to get you to go out with them. So that way you can become like them. So then now when you walk in, you just as dark as they are. Now you're struggling with things that you hadn't struggled with for years. Y'all having conversations about stuff that you shouldn't be having conversations for. And so now how are you going to talk to them about God? You're not going to be able to do it because you gave up your difference. But as long as you're standing there and you're saying, you know what? I'm going to be this light. There's going to always going to be somebody that's going to want to take your difference away. But apostolics are a bit different. See, apostolics are the type of people who will say this. I know it's going to hurt. I know it's tight, but it's good for me. I know I don't. Then listen to me. There's things in the word of God. I promise you, if he gave me 20 seconds to just change some things, I promise you there's going to be some things changed. I promise you. And the first thing is going to be loving your enemy. I promise you I'm changing that one off the top. But I got to deal with the word of God and I got to say, you know what? I'm going to do this too. Even though it may hurt. There's things that come across this pulpit, man. I'm telling you, I'm screaming and I'm squirming because I know he's talking to me in my situation. You, how many, man, what, you think I want to hear Bishop talk about consistency? How many of y'all like consistency? That's what I thought. But guess what? He's right. He's telling us what God loves. And so even though I don't like it, I'm saying, you know what? The difference is, even though I don't like it, I'm going to do it anyway. Because that's what God is asking me. That's what the world is unwilling to do. The world is unwilling to go against what they feel in their hearts and in their flesh to serve God. They're not willing to give up those things. There's things that God asks me to give up, and I just don't understand why. But I do it. That is because it's right. Exactly. Because it's right. And lastly, our difference is what connects us to our God. It's your difference that connects you to God. That's why you can't give it up. Luke 24, 45 says, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name, speaking of Jesus, among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You see, in the apostolic church, we preach repentance. But we preach it differently from the rest of the world. See, the rest of the world says this. Lord, forgive me. I'm forgiven. Like some genie just going to come and forgive you. But what we teach is the only way to truly be forgiven is to turn away from the mess that you're doing. And walk away from it. See, repentance is more than a mental ascent. Repentance takes action. It takes you moving away from it. Jeremiah 18 and 8 says this. It says, if that nation against whom, have I, whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I've thought to do unto them. If you want God to accept you into his fold, if you want God to say, you know what, I'm going to take your name off of hell's roll, then you're going to have to turn away. You can't just say, God, I'm sorry for the things I've done and keep doing them. That don't make sense. When I was young, we used to curse and say, God, forgive me. And it was just like, it was just a habitual reaction. We hadn't, we weren't really asking for forgiveness. It just sounded good to do. Curse, God, forgive me. And then you, you never had any intentions on never cursing again. You just, it was just something to do. That doesn't work. There's people who ask God to forgive them every day but are not trying to turn away from their sins. The difference that you have is that you must turn away from your sins. You must say, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to keep going in that direction because that's how I keep getting in trouble. So I'm just going to look at you and I'm going to keep walking your way. Well, that's a part of our difference. 
Baptism is a part of our difference. We don't just get baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We get baptized in the name of Jesus because it tells us that's what removes our sins. I need my sin. Listen, I got a lot of sins that needed to be removed. I had to go down in Jesus' name. I mean, I've seen people go down in the water, and, and, and they must have been pretty bad. Because when they came out, they was almost like floating. They was like, wow, man, like I had this heaviness on me, and now I just feel so good. And I'm thinking, what have you done in your life that man was just saying you so heavy? But I'm telling you, there's people walking around carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders because it's just filled with sin. Some of the things that they've done, they'll never tell you. But when they go down in that water, he removes all of their sins. And then all of a sudden, they become light. That's a part of our difference. I need that because I want to be in heaven with God. And I can't be in heaven with God with sin upon my life. Some might say, the, well, you can learn a lot from a Muslim because they pray five times a day. And so we can, if we just coexist, we can learn from each other. But listen, I understand what you're saying. But if a Muslim pray five times a day, ten times a day, fifteen times a day, don't really matter. If he hasn't been down in Jesus' name, if he don't realize that Allah is not God, he can pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And there's some people that are struggling to pray twice a day who's been down, but they got a heart to live for God. And when the rapture takes place, they're just going to come up out of here. Oh, okay, I know you don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. There's going to be some people that make it that's not praying five times a day. We don't have to coexist. We need to just tell them what the truth is. Guess what? Muslims get converted like everybody else. You just got to tell them. They don't want you to tell them. They want you to just go along to get along. We can't do it. If a Jew comes to this church, I got to tell them, look, your physical circumcision doesn't mean anything. But what you need to do is you need to walk up these stairs and go get baptized in Jesus' name. Well, I'm just telling you the truth. I know a lot of people, we love Jews, oh, pray for Israel and all that, and I'm with you. I'm going to pray for them, and I love them. But if I go to Israel, and I'm at the wailing wall, and they're praying, I'm going to be like, you need to be baptized. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I know you don't believe that he's the Messiah, but he is. They may not like it. I mean, and you know, Israel, they'll, they'll, they'll send a plane to hurt you. <laughs> they don't care. But you got to tell them the truth, too. Correct? We can't just go along to get along. We have to tell the truth. Well, baptism is a part of our difference. Also, the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. It's a part of our difference. This is when God comes inside of you and gives you the strength to do the things that he's asked you to do because you can't do them on your own. I guarantee you this, if you could do everything that God asked you to do on your own, then there would be no need for God. There really wouldn't be. If I could stop lying, cheating, fighting, doing all this craziness by myself, why do I need to come to a church? But most of you know that you tried to stop doing things and couldn't, and that's why you came here. And if you would be honest, you would be able to say that when you came to this altar, God filled you with his spirit, then all of a sudden you were able to do those things. And every day you're getting better and better. You may not be where you want to be, but you're showing not who you used to be. You may say, yeah, I still got some issues that I'm trying to get God to help me with, but I can look back over my life and I can see that God is taking me out of some places. I can see that he's taking some things out of me. Holiness. Holiness is a part of our difference. Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If you're going to see the Lord, you're going to have to live a holy life. Come on. You can't still be drinking, doing drugs, hanging out in the wrong places, watching bad things. You can't keep doing it and think you're going to make it to heaven. You got to have that difference. 
Why is the difference so important? It's a good question. First Peter 2 and 9, our text. It says, because ye are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, a peculiar people. This is why. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason why you must maintain your difference is because you have to show the rest of the world what God can do. You see, there's people every day who wants to check out of this world by their own hand. They're sick of their lives. They have so much trouble. If they just sit down and talk to you, you'll probably get depressed along with them. And they're looking for a way out. And if you don't have a difference when they look at your life they see their lives well then guess what they're not coming to you to try to find out how to get out of their trouble you won't ever get the opportunity to tell them about Jesus but they'll look at a Muslim who really is praying five times a day I work with a lady every day she came in and she had her scarf on her head. She didn't care what nobody had to say. Certain times of the day, didn't matter if she had a student on the phone. She get that student off the phone and she went outside and she walked around and she prayed. It would be terrible for somebody who was looking for a way out to see her and say, she's different from me. Let me go find out what she believes when you were sitting right there the whole time. But because whenever they were talking about foolishness, you were right in the midst of the conversation. Whenever they were talking about things that we shouldn't be watching, television, movies, you knew the whole movie and could tell them all about it. They didn't see a difference in you. It would be sad for them to go somewhere else looking for a difference when there's an apostolic who should have been a lighthouse right there the whole time. Don't give up your difference. Don't give it up because somebody is depending on you.